Why don't we start and we'll read uh, the opening scripture, and then we'll pray and get into the word. Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and had their being. Father, we pray for your blessing upon this time, this meditation on you as creator. May it um, cause us to grow in our wonder and our awe and our love for you and our gratitude to you. And I pray that you would help me to speak well with clarity. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna ask you to join me this morning in a, in a brief meditation on the Lord our God as creator. I find this topic uh, to be wonderful, very edifying. Um, I never want to lose the awe and the wonder of my Lord and Savior. And I believe that a consistent meditation on this topic will, will help us in that, in that goal leading to true praise and thanksgiving and worship. Um, recently, we, uh, my family, my, my daughter and her two kids went to California to visit my other daughter who uh, married an American, and, uh, but he's a nice guy, so, you know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, they live in, in California, and uh, this one outing uh, we planned was to visit a zoo that was down there to surprise my uh, 12 year old grandson Owen, who loves everything to do with Madagascar. He can tell you all the animals on Ma at Madagascar, all the things they do. Um, and we were able to surprise him with a trip to this zoo where there were meerkats and lemurs. There was a tiger. Uh, there was the, the coolest one in my mind was the giant anteater, just an un unbelievable critter. Uh, and um, it was awesome, and I, and I look, a red panda, who's seen a red panda when they're walking their dog down, and you just don't see these things, right? And even my son-in-law, who is an agnostic, commented on the wonder of these animals that live in parts of the world that if we didn't have a zoo, we'd never see them. And, and of course, Scripture reveals God as creator of all things, the natural world, the heavens, things seen, things unseen, and today I want to look at three aspects of God as our creator. And the first is probably the most obvious one. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything that is in them. Why did God create the universe? I think the simple answer is for his own pleasure and purpose. God didn't need to create anything to find fulfillment for he is complete in and of himself. He's not insecure, but yet it pleased him to do this. And the pinnacle of his creation is mankind, you and me, created in his image and likeness with a capacity for intellect and understanding that obviously distinguishes us from the rest of the created world. And also a capacity to commune with our creator commune with him spiritually, again, unlike the rest of creation. The Genesis account of creation implies God made the world and all its natural wonder and beauty for the benefit of mankind as a suitable environment for men and women to live and to grow and to learn and to flourish. Incredible generosity when you consider the account in Genesis, the vastness that was given to Adam and Eve with only one single prohibition. But everything else, everything else was for their benefit and their pleasure. And the rest of the natural world, the animals, the plants, the fish, and the birds, were given to mankind to manage and to enjoy. This matter of God being creator should not be peripheral to our faith, but central. 
I want us to listen to God's summation of the gospel to a world that is at enmity with him. It's like his final appeal. You can read about it in, in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. To every nation, tribe, language, and people, he said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. God is making an appeal to his creation, pardon me, to mankind through his creation. Now, if you've been paying attention at all over the last 150 years or so, you will realize that this is not the version of reality that is taught in our schools and universities or believed on by the average person in our world. Starting in the mid-1800s, the prevailing explanation for the beauty and complexity we see all around us has been attributed to random processes starting from less complex life forms that evolved into what we see all around us today. As you may be aware, this is called the theory of evolution. Interestingly, it's never represented as a theory, but that is what it's called. And I want to talk briefly about this theory. And I'm going to use a term macro evolution to distinguish the single cell turning into the human being over what is called natural selection, which is observable and measurable. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a chemist, and I'm not a biologist. So I'm gonna limit my comments on some really big picture ideas, beauty and complexity. Like I said, I'm not a scientist, but I do have a brain, and I can think and I can reason because I have been made in God's image and his likeness. Suppose you had the opportunity to look upon a beautiful painting. And the explanation given for its existence was that winds blew and water splashed randomly and given enough time, let's say three billion years, that painting materialized. Or suppose you stood before a magnificent building. That's the Taj Mahal, I've never been. And we're given a similar explanation of random occurrences over huge time spans, bringing about a structure of that magnificence and that beauty. What would your honest response be? I think we heard our, our honest response with someone laughing out loud. It's, it's, it's crazy. Ever since evolution, macroevolution again, was first postulated Technology has progressed so that we can see smaller and smaller and smaller and farther and farther and farther into the heavens. And every advancement of observation has revealed greater and greater levels of complexity than were ever imagined. And it's actually mind-blowing if you look into it, even on a surface level. At the time the theory of evolution was gaining traction, the single cell was thought to be quite simple, like a ping pong ball with some plasma in it. Now we know even single cells are made up of thousands of component parts, along with thousands of functions necessary for the cell to operate as intended. After considering the complexity and beauty of the universe, and then the explanation that we're given of macroevolution coming from these natural random processes over incredibly huge periods of time, a logical response, I think, is to consider probabilities. What is the likelihood 
that what we see in the universe came about by random chance. As stated, I am not a scientist. So I will now enlist the views of an eminent scientist to comment on these matters. Sir Fred Hoyle, Fred Hoyle, was a 20th century British astrophysicist and mathematician who formulated the theory of stellar nucleosynthesis. Anyone? <laughs> Me neither. He spent most of his working life at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge and served as its director for six years. In a 1950 BBC interview, he coined the term Big Bang. We've all heard the Big Bang uh, theory as the starting point of our universe. Well, he's the one that coined the term, except he didn't believe the theory. He thought it was nonsense. And the term Big Bang was basically used as a mockery. But it stuck, and we're still talking about the Big Bang. To my knowledge, Dr. Hoyle never argued his position from a biblical standpoint or Christian belief. But his insights into the probability of the universe coming to, into existence from random chance are worth considering. These quotes are sourced from creation.com. And he's quite funny too, so. The first quote, the notion that not only the biopolymer but the operating program of a living cell, one cell, could be arrived at by chance in a primordial organic soup here on earth is evidently nonsense of a high order. Again, he's referring to one cell. Our human bodies contain apparently about 100 trillion cells, one body, one human body, Hoyle also originated the famous illustration. I heard this illustration as a young believer. I did not know it was attributed or it was originated by a scientist who actually didn't believe the Bible. The famous illustration comparing the random emergence of even the simplest cell to the likelihood that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. And my personal favorite, Hoyle also compared the chance of obtaining even a single functioning protein by chance combination of amino acids to a solar system filled with blind men, each solving a Rubik's cube simultaneously. And again, I just want to clarify, we're talking about macro evolution from the non-complex to the incredibly complex over billions of years, like from the amoeba to the anteater to the architect, or if you prefer the, the little saying from the goo to the zoo to you. <laughs> That's macro evolution. This is different from natural selection where species adapt to their environment and pass the most suitable traits for survival onto their offspring. Natural selection is observable in nature. It's measurable. You can see it occurring. And Darwin used this observation of these species adapting to draw his conclusions, which he obviously took way too far. But when he saw the finches, the little birds on the Galapagos Islands that had different beak traits, that adapted to their environment and how they collected food. And he called this natural selection. But I want to point out, they were all finches. They didn't start turning into other forms of life. They remained finches. And no transitional forms, the old missing link, have ever been found in the um, uh, um, fossil record, nor have they ever been observed. So why does mankind insist on holding on at all costs to the logical absurdity that is macroevolution? Well, I think Paul tells us, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, 
that fallen mankind has a tendency to suppress the truth, suppress the truth in unrighteousness or in wickedness. They push it down, they put it out of sight. I won't talk about it, I'm going to shut my eyes to it, I won't consider it. Any explanation for the origin of the universe is preferable to the truth that God created. Because that would make mankind answerable to their creator. But what is the creator's testimony about these things? Again, we look to Romans chapter 1. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, speaking of fallen man, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Excuse me. Let's consider what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech, and night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. God's creation testifies to his reality. Lots more could be said on this vast topic. But let me finish this first point by noting that everyone believes a testimony. I don't think I'm going too far in this. We all believe a version of reality that we've either learned, that we've read, that we've been told, we found on YouTube, that we found on the website, or some combination thereof. We all believe something that has come to us. The world's version of reality, evolution with no God, is one testimony. Our Lord Jesus Christ said that at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female. He made mankind right at the beginning. And it literally comes down to who do you want to believe? Who has the credibility? And for those of us who do believe, I want to point out that every blessing available to a follower of Jesus Christ comes to us by taking God at his word. This is faith. Believing his testimonies, his version of reality. As the author of Hebrews says, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command and that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. That's an incredibly insightful statement that the writer of Hebrews, when you look at the, uh, what a microscope can see now in cells, I'm not sure that he really knew much about you know, cellular biology but the way that that phrase is, is, is worded in Hebrews really shows some insight, almost like it was inspired by a, by a greater power. Um, of course, we believe it was. So God created the heavens and the earth in all their vast array, but the creator is still creating. Point two, God spiritually recreates anyone who turns to Christ, receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We're, we often quote this verse in our Christian churches, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. The new birth from spiritual death to spiritual life, from darkness to light, is described in terms of a creator creating. Now let's look at the Genesis, Genesis account of God creating light on the first day. I find this very interesting. 
Genesis 1, uh, verses 3 to 5. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. It's fascinating to me that the creation of the sun and the moon, which provide the mechanisms through which we experience natural light, did not occur until the fourth day. So what is Genesis talking about on the, that happened on the first day? What is the light that is being talked about there? I believe the Apostle Paul can answer that question for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, he quotes from that Genesis account and says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Paul's interpretation of the day one creation of light is that God was creating the means by which we can know him and receive spiritual life. And using the terms light and darkness to describe our spiritual states, our spiritual status. And when anyone turns to Christ and receives the light of God, a new kind of life ensues a new creation, where our preoccupation is to fulfill God's purposes, to walk in his will, to get with his program. Again, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. As Paul writes elsewhere, I think in Galatians What counts, what really matters, is a new creation. So the Lord our God first created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. And second, he also creates newness of life, true spiritual life, recreating us in Christ. As we are in Adam naturally, so we are in Christ spiritually. And as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we also bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Thirdly, God will create again. Isaiah 65, 17 and 18. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. The psalmist wrote, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish and wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment, they will be changed but you remain and your years will never end. Cosmologists tell us that our universe is running down. It's running out, it's running out of steam, so to speak. Um, There's a theory called genetic entropy that talks about the gene pool in humankind is actually kind of coming to an end. Um, The mutations are getting worse in humankind These, again, are theories, but they speak to a world or universe that is expiring. But we need not fear or lose heart. For Peter reminds us, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. What are you looking forward to this morning? I would advise the new heavens and the new earth to uh, start pre- preoccupying your thinking. And I am looking forward to lunch too, by the way, but uh, different order of magnitude involved there. God who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will is moving everything in his creation toward 
this final state, a return to perfect fellowship with his creation and the elimination of the corruption of sin that has plagued this current creation. We are given some more wonderful verses in Revelation to encourage our fearful hearts and bring God's peace to us while this world continues to spin out of control. Allow these words to to wash over you. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. As it says elsewhere in that section of Revelation, the curse will be no more. Our Lord God as creator provides a wonderful meditation that I am convinced will increase wonder and awe, thanksgiving, and true worship in our lives. Seeing God's handiwork in nature, his handiwork in making us a new creation in Christ, and his promise of creating a new heaven and earth should cause us to be a rejoicing people declaring the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Lord, you are awesome. You are very great. Greater, I think, than we can even imagine or understand, but we come to you and you freely invite us to come near, come near. You've made the way. We can boldly come before your throne of grace There's so much we don't understand, but we trust in you. We trust in you, Lord. We trust in your testimony. We believe what you have said. We bless and thank you for your your grace in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.